So my name is Julia Lawal. I'm presenting OS scheduling with Nest. Uh, so I'm a researcher at INRIA, and this work was previously presented mostly, most of this work was presented previously at EURASIS, uh, which is a research conference. Um, so I wanted to present it here, maybe not necessarily to say this should go into the kernel, but maybe we can think about the issues that we're talking about in this talk, which is the relationship between scheduling and core frequencies. Um, so I'd also like to point out that the second author is sitting here in the audience. Um, so you're welcome to discuss this work with her as well. Okay, so I'll start out with um, just what is scheduling. So the goal of a task scheduler is to place tasks on cores when there are um, when a task is forked or wakes up or when there's a need for load balancing. And then a, a task scheduler also, when a core has nothing to do at the moment, it figures out which of the cores, which of the tasks on the cores one queue should run. So we're actually only interested in the first of these aspects um, in this talk. Uh, so the challenge is to, that we're going to be interested in is how can we place tasks on cores in a way that synergizes with the features of the hardware. So a very simple feature of the hardware is that a core only does one thing at a time. So this leads to the process, the, the um, feature of, sorry, um, of the, yes, sorry, this leads to the property of work conservation, which is that since a core can only do one thing at a time, there's no point to put several tasks give several tasks to a core because it's not going to do work on them if it happens that some other equally useful cores are idle at the moment. It would be better to put it on idle ones than on the ones that are already doing something. So here we have a little example. We have a teeny tiny machine that has only four cores. Two of the cores are occupied with some tasks and we have some task T3 which comes along. So where would we like to put it? And clearly we might like to put it on core one or core three. Um, because then the task will be able to start running immediately, won't have to wait for task one or task two to complete. So that's all pretty obvious. Um, so we're actually interested in another feature, which is um, called dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, DVFS. Um, so basically the cores can run at different frequencies and we have a trade-off. Higher frequencies allow the application to run faster. On the other hand, they generate more heat and they uh, consume more energy and lower frequencies cause the application to run slower. However, in principle, they save energy and can, uh, generate less heat. We have this trade-off. Basically, the principle, which is uh, respected by Intel servers and AMD servers, which are the ones that we have looked at primarily, um, more activity on a core results on, in a higher frequency. So this is implemented in some cases by the operating system, which may decide what frequency should be used um, based on recent activity and expected future activity. And it may also be decided by the hardware itself, which observes there are uh, a lot of things have been happening on a certain core, which causes the frequency of the core to go up. Um, there's another feature which is called the turbo frequencies. Turbo frequency, so the machine has some nominal frequency. The turbo frequencies are some higher frequencies that can be used. Um, but actually, we saw this already in Len's talk. Um, on Intel machines, the, the basic problem is, is if you run at these higher frequencies, your machine is going to get too hot and it will not be able to cool itself down. And so the machine deals with this problem in some way. So on Intel machines, um, there's a, only a restricted number of cores that can run at certain turbo frequencies. So the highest turbo frequency perhaps is only, only if you have up to two active cores can you use that turbo frequency. AMD machines seem to have a different behavior that I've looked at a little bit, but not in great detail. Um, so then we can think about DVFS and how it relates to scheduling. So we have our exactly our, the same setup we have before. We have our four cores, we, two of them occupied, and we have a new task T3 that shows up. And so we can ask ourselves, on what core should we put T3? And based on the information available, it's that we have the same answer. Two of those cores are empty, and so those cores would be a good choice. Um, but if we know something extra, which is that 
recently the scenario actually looked like this, um, then it could be a good choice actually to put T3 on core one because T1 has, sorry, T0, TAS T0 has somehow warmed up that core. Um, it had, there's been a lot of activity on that core. Maybe it's running already at a high frequency and then T3 will benefit from that high frequency. Um, and also if we put, if we don't put T3 on um, core one, but rather put it on T core three, then the hardware may think that there are actually four active cores and that may cause the highest turbo frequency that's reachable to be lower than if it sees only three active cores. Uh, so this comes to the NEST scheduler. So the idea of the NEST scheduler is to take all these different issues that I've been discussing into account. Um, so there are basically two ideas. The first idea is to reuse cores. Um, so if we can reuse cores, then we will have fewer cores that are being used. And on the one hand, they will seem to be more active, so they will get a higher frequency. And also we will work better with the turbo constraints. If there's only, at least on Intel machines, if there are fewer cores being used, then we can go for higher frequencies. Um, so for that, we maintain what we call a nest of recently used cores. So basically nest is taking the ideas of CFS. CFS is when you wake something up, it's going to search over the entire machine or over the entire socket. And we're restricting the set of cores. We don't want the entire socket or the entire machine. We just want a restricted set of cores that have been used recently. And so if we only search over this restricted set, we are more likely to use a core that we have used recently. Um, and so the second idea is to keep cores warm. Uh, so often what happens is that you run for a little while and then you pause and then you run a bit more. In the case of Nest, since we feel like we're going to be reusing cores, it seems like it might be a good idea to somehow artificially keep that core at a high frequency because it's going to be used soon. Um, so for that, we uh, do some spinning briefly when a core goes idle and in, in a goal of keeping up the frequency. Uh, so now I'll look at all of this in more detail. That, that was just the main ideas of the talk we've seen already. Uh, so this is how CFS works. And so the basic scheduler of Linux kernel for general purpose tasks. Um, when a, so this application is uh, running con the configuration process of LLVM. Um, sorry, the configuration for the compilation of LLVM. So I've actually studied configuration for various applications, including the Linux kernel. So they all behave in kind of the same way. Uh, they fork off a lot of little processes to see if different services are available on the machine. Uh, so what happens is so this graph is showing, we have time on the bottom, we have the cores on our machine uh, with their various numbers on the Y axis and the colors show the frequency in general um, red is the highest frequency and blue is the lowest frequency that will be on it would be that way on all of my graphs. Um, so you see here we have sometimes occasionally the highest frequency, but often lower frequencies. Uh, so what's going on? So basically the way that CFX works is that when a task wakes up, it looks, there's a core that which is called the target, which is often just the place where the core was, where the task was before. Um, and then it, it looks at that core, sees if it's idle, and then it looks at the next one, 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 and wraps around. And so that's where we have this right angle. This, this, everything is always an angle. It's always going upwards um, because you might start searching at this place. Maybe the task was running there before. Just one second. And um, then you will look at the subsequent cores and then it ang always angles upwards. It's never going to notice that actually a core with a lower number is available and might be a good place to put this activity. So yes, we need, sorry, the box. Thank you. Uh, just have a question. Um, when you're deciding on which next score to place, uh, do you um, think about NUMA topology at all? Uh, so this is, this is not me, this is um, CFS. And if on a wake up, it's going to be just looking inside the same socket. This is a machine with two sockets, but each socket is quite large. It has uh, 16 physical CPUs and thus 32 uh, hyper threads. And given the number of threads we have in this application, 
I mean, the size doesn't matter that much because there's plenty of room available. The answer is yes, the load balancer pulls on the other side. <laughs> Okay. But, but not here. Not here. This is this is just wake yeah. ups and forks. There's no load balancing. Yeah, uh, no NUMA load, load balancing yeah. doesn't happen at this time that she's talking about. It happens later. Oh, okay. Yeah, the reason why I was asking is was um, in some testing I did, I noticed that depending on how you place the processes with regards to the NUMA topology, um, you you can achieve in as high as like thirty percent power use difference. Um, so that's what I was asking. Yeah, sure, Thank but that's, that's not what's going on here. Actually, yeah. to get this, the thing to fit better, maybe this is confusing for people who are very familiar with this architecture. I renumbered the cores so that the consecutive numbers are on the same socket. Oh, sorry. Um, but basically what we see is we see a bunch of stuff and we see that they are spread out over about seven cores, um, which is a lot. And one thing, it's not really, completely apparent from this graph because of the granularity of the graph, but actually not very many things are actually, there's not much concurrency here, very little is actually happening at the same time. And so this leads us to the idea of underload. Um, so it's just a different perspective on the thing that I showed before. So our idea of underload is that, what is the relationship between the amount of actual concurrency and the number of cores that are actually being used? So here's a completely artificial graph. Um, we have uh, this task that runs all the time, and then we have these other tasks that run for a shorter time. And it's easy to see that actually there's only two tasks that ever run at a time, um, but we're actually using three cores for them. So we say this is an underload of one because we could have collapsed all of these tasks onto just two cores. And so we can see for our configuration application that we saw before, uh, there's lots of underload. We're using a lot more cores than we actually need at any given point in time. And so with Nest, where we're reusing cores instead of letting the tasks just drift off of, across the cores, we can actually obtain this. There's actually, we only ever new, need uh, at most two cores at a time and then they are running at the highest frequency. And this is just showing the beginning of the application, but over, for the complete process, we get a 16% uh, performance improvement. Um, so in terms of underload, we still have a little bit of underload. So the, I, the whole idea is that we need to keep the nests at a small size so that we are forced to reuse cores. So we're not perfect about that, but it's something we, um, that's happening dynamically, and so it's it's hard to be perfect when you're making choices dynamically. Um, but there's only two small cases of underload here, the red bars, and we don't have the huge underloads that we had before. Okay, so now I'm going to present the whole thing again in a bit more detail. Um, so the main idea for the reusing the cores is this idea of a primary nest. So as I mentioned before, we keep a small set of cores that have been reused re used recently, and those are the ones we're going to search among, and then we can um, end up uh, reusing cores instead of drifting across the machine. And given that we had the question about the NUMA nodes, actually we search across this primary nest first on the same NUMA node as the target, and then only fall back on the rest of the machine if it's necessary. Um, so we complement the primary nest with what we call a reserve nest. So these are a few other cores that we might like to search over if we need to expand the primary nest. So there, there were, or if that we might like to save in reserve if we need to decrease the primary nest. Um, so cores that have were in the primary nest but have not been used in a while. So those would be good choices if we run out of space and need to add more. And they're also, um, we, if we run out of cores that are in all of these nests, we just fall back to normal CFS and like ask it for another core. And that one goes into the reserve nest. Um, so this, this issue of the reserve nest is, it also goes back to something like Len was saying. Sometimes we need another core because some K work has drifted by on the cores that we are interested in. And so we need extra one, but just because of this little tiny K worker, that doesn't mean that we want to put that core in the primary nest because being in the primary nest says, this is like the working set in terms of cores of the application. Um, 
And so the whole challenge is, of course, to make these nests be the right size so that we get the reuse that we want. Um, so here's a running example. Again, we have the green, which is the primary nest, the blue, which is the reserve nest. We have this situation. We have some task that wakes up. And so first we look in the primary nest to see if we can find a core for it. Of course, in this case, we can't. So that fails. And then we look in the reserve nest to see if we can find a core for it. And we can't, again, because they're all filled up. Um, and so we go back to CFS and we ask, sorry, as I just, you know, this is the thing I mentioned about the sockets. And so we go back to CFS and ask for a core that's going to be this one here. And it's going to go into the reserve nest first. So um, some time goes by, that task um, went to sleep. And now there'll be a fork or a wake up or whatever. Now we have a new task we need to place. And first we look in the primary nest and the primary nest is all filled. Um, then we look in the reserve nest and this time we find something. And the fact that we have used this core twice is our heuristic to say, okay, this is an important core for our application. And so it's actually going to get moved into the primary nest. So it turns green. Um, of course, we don't want the primary nest to just grow and grow forever because then we'll just go back to the CFS situation where we have, so we're searching over more cores than are really necessary. Um, and so then we have some kind of garbage collection for these cores as well. Um, so the primary nest, if a uh, uh, core in the primary nest is moved back to the reserve nest, if um, a, a task terminates on the primary core, then we figure, okay, we don't need this core anymore. It goes to the reserve nest so it can come easily back, but we think for the moment we don't need it. Um, and if a, if a task goes to sleep, we keep it in the primary nest for a couple of ticks, but then after a while we say, okay, we can go to the reserve nest as well because it might not wake up for a long time. Um, so that was the idea of reuse. We have a small nest in which we see, yeah, search for things. Um. Um, do any of the cores ever drop completely out of all the reserve nests, like, or? Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. Um, I didn't go into this detail, but actually the reserve nest has a limited size, and when you've used up that size, they, those cores just disappear. Yes? <laughs> I don't think I have. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, no. You distracted me, I forgot what I was going to ask. Uh, but one other question is uh, spinning while waiting for the, keep the, the CPU busy seems like uh, you're fixing the symptom than the cost, right? It almost seems like you should need to make DVFS smarter than trying to give it the wrong signal to keep it at a higher frequency, right? Yes, it's a possible idea, yeah. Um, and the other question was, I'm guessing you'll get to this later, how much power savings did you see? Kind of curious and the other part is we have a similar situation we notice in android and mobile uh, arm cpus where we see things in a sense kind of spread out too much we'd like mm -hmm. to see if there's any benefit in bringing them all together in fewer cores mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't had any strong data yet to show it's going to be helpful because a lot of this also depends on the particular cpu you're testing on some cpus don't like being auto idle some handle it pretty well your DVFS graphs matter a lot. So I'm kind of curious how this all kind of falls into place. Yeah, so um, when I get to the end of the talk, we might like to discuss that again, um, or I'll have some, I'll say some things about that. Um, so yeah, so he asked about spinning. So this is just the idea that we, um, when a nest has leaves the core, we spin for a little while, that we cause the idle process to spin for a little while. Um, we, it's so it's supposed to be long enough for the to keep the frequency high for the next task, but not too long because if it, you keep it spinning too long, then it will interfere with the ability of other cores to enter their tur highest turbo mode. So we don't want to do that. Um, so it's just a heuristic of a couple of ticks that it spins. Um, so there are some more issues about, um, sorry, how much time do I have left? 25 minutes. Okay. Um, There's a question. Like, oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Um, we have a better tool to manage DVFS in the schedule now until um, 
Util clamp, uh, it requires scheduled utils CPU frag governor by setting new clamp min to a specific value. You can bias frequency selection to honor this value. Yeah, I'm not sure to fully understand the question. Um, maybe oh. someone else. Do you want to? Is there any, OK, uh, there is now an interface, uh, a user space interface you can actually use to specify you want to run basically at uh, a DVFS point. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can already influence directly the DVFS choices from user space. So I guess the question is, uh, why not using that interface instead of uh, basically trying to achieve the same via the scheduling? By spinning? Yeah, by spinning, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, um, that's the way I understood the yeah, other question. Yeah, I'm not sure. So that's... An additional, com an additional comment that was just made. Um, it's, it's an observation rather than a question. Okay. Um, I, mean, I, I would just observe that the spinning in practice is useful when we're talking about several microseconds. Long, I don't know if interaction with user space makes a lot of sense in that context. Um, but I can look into it or look at the person who's discussed with the person who's asking the question later or something like that. Um, so we have another, a couple of other heuristics that allow us to better keep track of the size of the mass that we want. Uh, one of them is the idea of a task becoming attached. Um, this actually goes back again to the the observation of Lynn about the K worker showing up and then the task has to move off to the side. Um, we would rather, like, the way CFS is, is focused always on the previous core where the task was. Yes? Yeah, there's another, uh, so there's another question online. Um, if I understand it correctly, um, is the uh, reserve primary nest global? If yes, would there be any overhead when switching between nests? Uh, at the moment, the nests are global. We're considering making the nests more local to individual applications. Um, I'm not sure to understand how there would be an overhead between switching between nests. Okay. Um, um, so, sorry, to go back, uh, a task is disturbed by some kind of demon that shows up on their core. They get moved off to some other core. And if we kind of leave that as the focus point of that task, then our tasks are going to kind of drift around. As they get bothered by care workers, then they will kind of get focused on their new positions as opposed to their old positions that was in the original um, nest. And so we keep, instead of keeping just the one, his, one level of history as CFS does, we have two levels of history. Um, and so that will tend to move the tasks back into the nest and kind of keep them on the same set of course. Uh, we also have the idea of tasks that are impatient. So since for some kinds of applications, the, you might have several tasks which manage to always fit, they never run at the same time, and so they always manage to fit on the same core. That might change over time as they kind of drift. And so a task might discover that it is always in, getting interfered with by another task. In that case, the task becomes impatient, and then we just fall back directly to CFS because we feel like we need to get the primary nest to become as big as possible. Um, we also, our, our goal is that nest should work well for the kinds of applications where it works well, kind of the things that have lots of scattered tasks that run for short periods of time. Um, and that nest is not going to give us any benefit if we have like another common case is we have 64 cores, we have 64 threads, they just run all the time continuously. Um, just one second. Sure. Um, uh, they, so that's not, we're not going to get any benefit in that case if we don't want to get any overhead in that case either. And so we make it for, to address that, we make CFS be more aggressive about how it search for cores, what we call wake up work conservation. And that way we can get the nest to be the proper size for the application as quickly as possible. Yes. Yep, so um, per task has its own data flush previous tasks. Um, the dollar sign I, dollar sign D data is not good idea. Um, that's, I guess, the cache, um, instruction cache and data cache. 
Now, the good deal with that, would a NIST scheduler focus on threads in one process, but still use CFS between the processes? Sorry, yep. I okay. really didn't understand that. Let me repeat that. So per task has its own data. Flush previous tasks um, caches is not a good idea. Would Nest Scheduler focus on threads in one process, but still use CFS between the processes? Uh, the way that Nest works at the moment is you say, I'm running this application. I would like to run it with Nest. And the other applications just run with CFS in the normal way. Okay. So we change the different operations of the scheduler to look and see if it's using nest and then to use the nest operations in the case otherwise it just uses cfs all right thanks i'm not sure if that answers the question but there's another question behind you oh. it seems to me it seems to me that this is where attached processes help um because they will tend to migrate processes back to calls they just run on which still have their data in cache mm -hmm. um the question of um where the, if you've got where the multiple processes can become attached to one core at the same time and fight over the over the cache utilization is one I'm not clear about. That should probably be avoided if possible. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't catch everything, but it's, you said something about caches. So one could be concerned that because we're concentrating the executions on, um, we may have like multiple tasks which are sharing a single core. And so they will be flushing each other's catches as we go along. Um, so we have done a lot of performance experiments and we haven't seen that as a problem in practice, but of course, uh, for certain applications, it could be a problem. It's oh, I, got one. I think you want to run a uh, net perf round robin. <laughs> okay. Net perf round robin. So about a year ago, I did an experiment um, with wake up where as you, that processor I was describing before with the P cores on the left, I said, well, why don't we, why doesn't wake up always just search for one of those and sort of sort left? And uh, it made a bunch of benchmarks go faster, but net, net perf got worse, okay? And the reason was because there was no cache locality and these threads are waking up every five microseconds, right? And it was, it was, and they really wanted to have a hot cache. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll try that, thank you. So how does this algorithm take care of, uh, you know, preventing thermal hotspots? You are running them on the same course all the time. So is there a risk of, you know, heating up a part of the package or a part of the chip by keeping the rest of them idle? I mean, do you want to, at some point in time, change what the nest was just to spread the heat around uniformly? Okay, so I gave this talk at a energy conference and they were concerned that I was going to be running things on two cores forever and then that would destroy the machine and it would be bad for um, you know like the intrinsic cost of making the machine actually uses lots of energy as well so I think that's the things what you're asking about so so indeed um, we could like nest is also not perfect and so the cores the threads do actually drift off to the side sometimes um, but one could introduce some kind of artificial drift every second or something like that that would address that issue yes um if that's an issue you should contact your hardware vendor okay <laughs> <laughs> okay um so the last thing is because nest is reducing the number of cores that are considered then it increases the chance that two cores that want to wake up tasks at the same time will actually choose the same core and so we add a compare and swap on the choice of the cores so that that can't happen anymore. So that's something that can happen in CFS as well, but it happens more often in NEST. And so you get unexpected overloads. Uh, so now we have the evaluation. Um, this is the underload for a whole bunch of different configuration things we have. This is the average underload over the entire execution. So we're often using one, two, three, four cores too many. And then you can see in the red and yellow parts that Nest basically gets rid of that. Um, for performance, we can see here this. Now we have uh, in all of these slides with performance, we have two lines. We have the line for zero and we have another red line here for 5%. So anything that's above 
the red line I consider to be an interesting performance improvement. Below 5%, it, it's hard to, hard to say. Um, so basically, obviously, we, we do, our baseline is CFS Skedutil, and we do CFS Performance, we do Nest with Skedutil, and Nest with Performance. So performance says that basically the frequency should be the nominal one at least. It might use the turbo frequencies if possible. Skedutil is an algorithm that tries to both give good performance when a lot of activity is happening and give energy savings when less activity is happening. Um, so basically, not surprisingly, we get a performance improvement with performance, um, but we get a lot more performance improvement with Nest because we're, allow we're making it possible to use the higher turbo frequencies. Performance doesn't do anything about the task placement, and so you end up with, still end up with eight cores or so being used, and so you're limited to whatever it will do with that for um, the turbo frequencies. Yes, it's a question. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. So, I actually tried to do something similar to this with CFS. Okay. So, uh, in the CFS, you have energy aware scheduling, which you might be aware of, where uh, they try to do something similar, where, uh, but for different reasons. Uh, it's more like, uh, you know, by packing tasks onto the little cores, you can, uh, you know, keep the big cores idle and save power. Um, so, unfortunately, that's very tangled up with ARM and, you know, config options and all this stuff. So, I tried to uh, take that code out and uh, make it such that we could apply uh, apply the same, you know, task packing to x86. Um, I did not see that much improvement, but I'm curious if, like, uh, you know, we can apply this to, to, to that and, and reuse some of that co <coughs> code. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I didn't do the idle spinning uh, stuff like that. That might uh, make a big difference. And uh, about the idle spinning, I think uh, there is, uh, like you said, uh, the turbo frequency aspect, but there's also the aspect of like, I think the uh, idle latency, like coming in and out of idle, I think the spinning can help there as well. So the, yeah. the uh, so okay. yeah, so. Oh, um, in this one, we're actually able to isolate where the performance benefit is coming from. Like, as in, do you know if it's because your cache locality is better? Or, for example, if you fix the frequency, if you, if you remove the turbo frequencies as an option, do you still see performance benefit? Have you been able to isolate Yeah, so I haven't looked at that. I've only looked at the frequency. This is the frequency information. Um, so we have these little groups of four. Sorry, um, we have little groups of four, and so first the first two are CFS, and the last two are Nest, and so you see more red. Remember, red is the highest frequency. For many of them, we have like all red with Nest, and we have less red with CFS. Okay. So it'd be interesting experiment, like to suggest to get rid of the, um, like just force the machine to a fixed frequency and then see. Or even like remove turbo as an option. We can set an upper limit yeah. on the frequency. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, so we have performance improvements and here's where the, um, how, how the frequencies cause those performance improvements. And for this particular case, which is kind of the ideal case for Nest because we, have to, we take lots of spread out processes and collapse them onto only two cores, we make the application much, much faster. Uh, we can actually save energy because we are just finishing faster. And actually these this machines that we use seem to have a lot of a high uncore frequency and use a lot of energy just for the uncore aspect. Um, so by finishing faster, we even though we run at a higher frequency, we can still save energy. Uh, so, obviously, configuration of software is not the only thing people ever do. So, we ran everything on the, um, the benchmarks of the Pharonix multi-core suite, which is uh, about 200 applications that all do all different kinds of things. Um, as I mentioned before, our goal is that Nest should not harm applications that are not getting any benefit from Nest. And so, you see, actually, for many of them, we... Um, 
we just have no change, 159 out of the 200, but there are about 40 that actually do better. Um, so these were not applications that were specifically chosen for Nest, they're just completely random applications. Um, so all these numbers that we've seen so far are for Linux 5.9. Um, so there's a caveat with all of what I've been talking about. So, what, what, so basically the idea of Nest is that Nest is trying to make things work better based on an understanding of how the operating system and the hardware works. So if the operating system and hardware don't do what we expect them to do, then Nest will still reorganize things in a certain way, but we won't necessarily get the improvements that we hoped for. Um, so, before it ha so it happens that before Linux 5.0, Nine, sorry, before 5.11, uh, Schedutil, so this is the only concern, Schedutil, Schedutil is using this, this uh, function here for changing the frequency. So Schedutil measures utilization and chooses a frequency that it thinks corresponds well to that utilization. Um, so before 5.11, it was using this function. This function amounts to a suggestion. Um, so it will say use uh, two gigahertz or something like that, and maybe the hardware will do that, or maybe the hardware will do something else. Um, since 5.11, they use a different function for um, these machines that have a feature called HWP, and this actually forces the machine to do to run at a particular frequency, unless that frequency violates the turbo constraints. So we can look at how that how Nest works out with that. This is a different application, which is H2. It's a part of the Decapo benchmark suite for Java programs. So the graphs are a bit small, but you can basically see that these are the colors are kind of purplish and so on. They're not blue, basically. So there's something above the lowest frequency. Um, there, on the other hand, the threads, the tasks get really scattered out across the entire machine, so we don't achieve the highest turbo frequencies either. Uh, and for that's with performance, with Schedutil, the um, frequencies are lower. They're not at the lowest point, but there's a lot of green in here, which is a fairly low frequency color. Uh, so this is 5.9, then we can run Nest, and Nest we see, so the thing to notice here is this is about 37 seconds, and this is 43 seconds. When we run Nest, we end up with 35 seconds, 36 seconds. So, I mean, it's it, for performance, there's not much difference because we were already using the turbo frequencies, but for Schedutil, we get a good benefit. The performance and Schedutil are about the same, but now we can use Schedutil, so we get lower frequencies being used when, at the times when we're not actually doing very much. So perhaps that's a benefit. Um, but if we try, I also implemented Nest in 5.15. Um, and then the results were quite disappointing. So performance, everything is quite fine. It's performance is exactly what we were at before. This is a little bit faster, but might not mean anything. On the other hand here, it's unfortunately, you can't see this very well, um, but now it's taking 70 seconds. And this up here, it's hard to see, but it is all blue. It's always at the lowest frequency. And that's pretty much how this application looks when you run it um, without Nest, with just CFS. It's also always at the lowest frequency. And so the problem is the way that Schedutil now works, this idea of fourth, or actually Schedutil was already always um, choosing quite a low frequency, but now that it's actually imposing the frequency, now the, the hardware doesn't have the choice to raise the frequency because more exciting things seem to be happening. So you can't really, unfortunately, you can't see it very well, but we, we are consolidating the core tasks on the cores in exactly the same way before. But the problem is that if you zoom in, you can see that there's still little gaps between things, the things that are happening. So you run for a little while. I mean, like Nest is going to take all that stuff and collapse it onto a single core, but it won't erase the gaps between, uh, between actions. And so those gaps cause Schedutil to choose a low frequency. That's just the way the Schedutil algorithm works. And the, all of that spinning that we try to do has no impact because Schedutil is not taking what the idle task is doing into account. Uh, so in conclusion, we have introduced the Nest Scheduler. The idea of it is to reuse cores and hopefully to try to keep cores warm, although we were not completely successful with that in the 5.15 case. Um, we get a, 
performance improvements between like 10% and two times on applications that have kind of a, they're, they're multi-core applications, but they're not like using the entire machine all the time. Um, and we've tried a whole bunch of different kinds of machines um, for that. And we maintain the performance for applications that use the entire machine all the time. And as I, we showed on the previous slide, the impact of all of this depends on the actual power management strategy of the operating system and the hardware. If they we, it was designed to cooperate with how things worked in 5.9, but if more recent versions don't respect that, then we don't get all the benefit we hope for. And everything is um, publicly available, all the tools, all the, everything to make the graphs and so on. Thank you. Um, all right, so there's an uh, online question. Um, is Nest its own scheduler class with uh, EG its own pick next task function, or does it use CFS with Nest hooks like changing select task RQ function or something else? Sorry, what? Or do you want to read in here? Yeah, yeah, I can read myself. <laughs> you can switch it over to. Um, uh, let me just read the phone. Yeah. Um, is the Nest scheduler its own scheduler class? No, it's not the only. It's not its own scheduler class. It. Um, I just modified the existing code. Okay. Um, for what it's worth, I found it quite easy to modify the scheduler. It was no real problem. Um, it didn't crash very much. It was fine. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions? Need catch practice. Oh, you mentioned uh, trouble with spinning in idle and schedule not picking that up as, as a load. Uh, perhaps you could spin somewhere else, like, uh, you know, kernel thread or something else. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time on that, like two months or something like that, trying to get that to work. Um, so I, I, there's like the sked idle task and sked idle class. And then in principle, uh, it will only run when other tasks are not running. But there's some race conditions in the scheduler that cause can cause the, a sked idle task to run even if there is another task, real task waiting on the run queue. And then it, it once it starts running, it will just keep running. It won't, pre it won't get preempted by the other one showing up. I think they basically show up at the same time and the scheduler picks the wrong one. And um, that has destructive impact on the performance. Okay, so, I mean, I looked at the, I read up the, like some documentation about sked idle and it said mostly it should happen in this way or something, you know, mostly it should happen in a good way. So I didn't see like it should, I didn't see like any kind of guarantee. It should never run when there's another process available. But I don't know what the status of what people want from sked idle. So I didn't report it as a bug. Um, Right, so there's two questions online. Uh, the first one is, would uh, Nest scheduler decrease the semiconductor's life? Yeah, so I think I answered that one already okay. in the sense that I don't know if we always are, if we use the same core for hundreds of hours, like Len says, we should just complain to the manufacturer. Okay. So. The next question, um, could the Nest scheduler s simply switch P state policy instead of spinning? Um, and then the second part of this question, or that would keep the CPU at a high P state um, without taking any compute power away from the other hyper thread, or would that break turbo modes? Okay, so I think what you're asking, what the question is, is about the schedule tell in the more recent version of Linux. And so I was also thinking about, uh, in the last few weeks, about like, could I just uh, pretend that I had run? I mean, all, in terms of schedule tell, all we care about is the utilization. It's just the number. We could try to increase it. We don't even have to spin or do anything because schedule tell is telling the hardware what to do. The hardware is out of the loop now. Um, but I couldn't figure out a good way to do that. Um, 
the idea of spinning is you should just, it's just like a little boost for a little amount of time and not to fill up the entire gap. So, so it seemed complex, but maybe I missed something. It could be done in a different way. All right. So we're out of time, but. Sorry, this, okay. Um, or you could quickly, because we're sort of uh, out of time. Yeah, I'm sorry if I missed this part, um, but can the threads um, choose between going uh, being a nested thread or and just completely dropping out of it? Um, like, are are you able to change those states? Yeah, nothing. Nothing is planned for that at the moment. No. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you.